Listen to podcasts of Joe Walsh and Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson on the AM560 mobile app. Download it today at 560theanswer.com slash mobile. Talk of the morning, Dan and Amy. Uh, we mentioned in the Janus case that the Supreme Court is set to decide by the end of its term, at the end of next month. Uh, also, the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. Oh, yeah. Uh, Jack Phillips and Masterpiece Cake, the question of uh, whether or not you can be forced in violation of uh, religious conscience to uh, participate in an event you don't want to participate in, like a same-sex wedding ceremony. Um, the Human Rights Campaign, which is a pro-LGBT organization, uh, has filed a brief with the Supreme Court against the claims of Jack Phillips in the Masterpiece Cake, cake Shop case. And uh, they've gotten a number of signatories, big companies that have all signed on on behalf of the Human Rights Campaign, uh, like Airbnb and Apple, American Airlines, Amazon, Amalgamated Bank, Cisco, Citigroup, Deutsche, Bank, Glassdoor, Intel, Levi Strauss, Marriott International, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Prudential Financial, Pfizer, PayPal, so on and so forth. So they filed a brief listing all those companies that are supporting? Yeah, a brief that you know included this in their amicus brief. And the question is, uh, should one of the questions, should um, conservatives do a little bit of what the left does and um, you know work to boycott organizations that promote values at odds with our own or, um, you know, just take a pass and let uh, a high school kid from Parkland, you know, try and take Laura Ingram off the air. I don't know. Uh, it's a uh, part of a uh, question of strategy and tactics in the um, with respect to advancing one view of what American culture should be and values it should reflect versus another, the so-called culture war, which is very real, except to the extent that conservatives continue to lead with surrender. For more on this topic and some reflections upon it, we're pleased to be joined now by George Weigel, who's a distinguished senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center and the author of the new book, The Fragility of Order, Catholic Reflections on Turbulent Times. George, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. My uh, pleasure. So uh, with respect to uh, the Masterpiece Cake Shop case and all these companies that signed on to the Human Rights Campaign's amicus brief, brief what, uh, what should the response, do you think, from conservatives be? Should it just be to highlight these companies and, and let uh, people make their own decisions? Should it be to try to do something organized to protest the way that the left uh, more routinely does when uh, companies run afoul of uh, their cultural Marxist dispositions? What do you think? I, I think uh, consumer pressures are, are good from from our side of these uh, of these arguments. Uh, they're not going to win uh, the day ultimately, however, because as I try to show in this book, we've got long-standing and deep-rooted uh, problems in our public moral culture that lead to these sorts of uh, outcomes, uh, this kind of cultural shaming and bullying. Uh, and ultimately to a bad uh, law. So we've got a, a, a large work of, of cultural rebuilding uh, to do in the United States. Uh, and the sooner we get about that, the sooner we might actually begin to see some effects of it in our lifetime. Well, one approach has been uh, to just surrender, as I mentioned, and uh, that's being advocated again, including in you know uh, otherwise conservative opinion journals like National Review last week. The uh, piece by J.J. McCullough that we discussed that got some attention suggesting, uh, you know, you just kind of compromise. So we need to treat transgender individuals with dignity. I guess that's our part of the compromise. I, that's not really a compromise. Do that anyway. That's not the issue. And uh, the cultural Marxists need to stop imposing their values uh, or their uh, perspectives on us in every walk of life. Well, and of course, that's incredibly naive. But this is sort of the kind of argument that was made uh, in advance of surrender on marriage redefinition. And so I wonder how you react to uh, surrendering on marriage redefinition so that we can set up our surrender on um, gender fluidity. Well, I, I think we have an extremely strong case on uh the transgender question, because there is simply no clinical evidence 
that uh, transgendering in either its mild forms or its more dramatic uh, surgical and hormonal forms has long-term positive outcomes. There simply is no evidence for this. Uh, and the more we can bring that uh, truth uh, to bear in public life, I mean, I think we have to have some confidence that the truth will uh, out, will win out uh, over uh, time. Um, the problem with uh, the marriage debate uh, was that the human rights campaign, which you um, referenced uh, a moment ago, uh, very, very cleverly identified this cause uh, with the last publicly agreed moral reference point in contemporary American history, which is the civil rights movement. That was a false uh, uh, identification, uh, but they, they made it stick. And they made it stick because we have, uh, as I discuss in this book, The Fragility of Order, uh, we have adopted in this country, not only culturally, but through the Supreme Court, an understanding of freedom uh, as defined by the great moral philosopher Frank Sinatra. Uh, <laughs> I did it my way. Uh, and as long as that uh, really quite childish notion of freedom, I did it my way, uh, dominates uh, the culture, it will dominate the law. So uh, if we want to fix the law, we're going to have to fix the uh, the culture uh, beforehand. Well, what do you think it says about our culture when we're almost, you know, in our schools and with some pediatricians almost pushing this questioning of your gender? You know, they, well, they... it's a, it's very this is this is really bad. I mean, lack of reality contact is bad for you. <laughs> I mean, this has been a uh, a self evident truth, if I can quote Thomas Jefferson, uh, for all of human history that you, you cannot indefinitely deny reality without doing damage to yourself and and those uh, around you. So uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, chapters in in the book we're discussing here uh, is is about the imperative of, of reality contact uh, in in public life, and we can't allow ourselves to be bullied and shamed into speaking the truth that there are certain givens in the human condition. There are certain givens in each of our individual lives, uh, and that to deny that is to make uh, for a lot of trouble and a lot of unhappiness. Uh, I mean, we have to reposition uh, the classic biblical morality uh, as the path to happiness. It, it's not a system of repression. The Beatitudes are the center of, of Christian moral thinking. Christian moral thinking is about saying yes before it's about saying no. All of the no's are, are fundamentally rooted in, in, in deeper and, and uh, uh, equally important yeses. So that's, that's a large task for, <clears throat> for the churches in the United States. Um, it's underway in, in some, some places. Uh, but we're, we're pushing against uh, a very, very strong cultural tide right now as you know and, and essentially it seems to me what you're arguing in your book the fragility of order is the need for a, another great awakening with uh, for christianity the the kind that uh, the first two iterations sort of insulated uh, america from the, uh, the the poisonous philosophy of the autonomous man that uh, came with the enlightenment and and so uh, are there other specific things that uh, clergy or uh, Catholic civic and business leaders should and Christian should be promoting or angles of instance they should take if if that if I'm reading your book correct in terms of what, well, the, let, what the need is? Yeah, let, let me let me first of all say that what I'm talking about by a new great awakening will involve both believers and unbelievers. It will involve all of those who believe that there are certain truths written into the human condition and into us. We used to call those the natural moral law. Mm. 
Uh, it'll parallel um, something of what we saw in Central and Eastern Europe in the 1970s and 80s, what Václav Havel uh, used to call living in the truth. Um, and I think that kind of a coalition uh, can uh, can be built. The first two Great Awakenings, by the way, were not placid businesses. Uh, no. The first Great Awakening preceded the American Revolution, and the second Great Awakening preceded the Civil War. So, you know, we're not talking about, I'm not talking about a historical phenomenon that leads, you know, to a, a great uh, calming down of public life. I'm talking about one that re-energizes public life uh, according to what Mr. Jefferson called in, in our national birth certificate, uh, self-evident moral truths. Yeah, but then, then how, how, how do we get from here to there? Is it, uh, you know, every parent reads uh, Abolition of Man to their kid before they go? Uh, well, that, that? Wouldn't, that wouldn't be a bad uh, place to start. Uh, it, it really does have to start retail, uh, but it also has to have a wholesale uh, component. Uh, cultural conservatives have to say to the Republican Party, uh, we do not wish to be treated as uh, the crazy uncle at Thanksgiving dinner uh, anymore. Uh, that would be a helpful start. And uh, w with respect to uh, politicians like Trump and uh, evangelicals and conservative Catholics have taken heat for supporting Trump because of his you know, personal conduct, past and present to some extent, and I, I go back to what Tony Perkins from Family Research Council said during the campaign and his continued support for Trump, even after the Access Hollywood tape came out and all that. And he said, look, um, my support for him was never about shared values. It's about the, the interest in protecting religious freedom and, and other interests that I have as a, a faith leader in this country. Um, and, it, you know, is that an acceptable position to take or how would you address the Trump the person versus Trump the political figure that a lot of conservative Catholics and Christians support? Well, I think uh, the present administration has been helpful, particularly in its judicial appointments, uh, in creating what I hope will be some space in our public life uh, over the next uh, 10 or 20 years for us to work publicly on, on this new Great Awakening. Uh, so I, I'm grateful for that. Uh, I don't think that the daily uh, vulgarization of uh, public life uh, emanating from the White House uh, helps lift up uh, these truths uh, which we need to re-enliven uh, in, in, uh, in American public life. I mean, Mr. Trump does seem to embody <laughs> The, you know, the Frank Sinatra theory of uh, freedom, as I, as I did in my way. So uh, I think that's that's a problem. But he is the president, and uh, one has to try to work with whatever materials are at hand to uh, to advance this this deeper cause of of, of national uh, renewal. But uh, are the shenanigans that are going on? Uh, particularly in, in his running commentary on his own life and everything else uh, helpful? I don't think so. He is George Weigel, Distinguished Senior Fellow of the Ethics and Public Policy Center. The book, which I highly recommend, uh, recommend reading everything George Weigel, Weigel writes, the book is The Fragility of Order, Catholic Reflections on Turbulent Times. George, thanks for joining us. Good luck with the book. Good. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line.